five standard excuses. Yeah. First, there's the excuse we used, for instance, in the Anthony Blunt case. Yes, which was? Uh, that there's a perfectly satisfactory explanation for everything, but security forbids its disclosure. Second, there's the excuse we use for comprehensive schools, that it only went wrong because of heavy cuts in staff and budget, which stretched supervisory resources beyond their limits. But that's not true, is it? No, it's a good excuse. <laughs> then there's the excuse we use for Concord. It was a worthwhile experiment, now abandoned, but not before it had provided much valuable data and considerable employment. But that is true, isn't it? Oh, no, of course it isn't. <laughs> the fourth, there's the excuse we used for the Munich Agreement. It occurred before certain important facts were known and couldn't happen again. What important facts? Well, that Hitler wanted to conquer Europe. <laughs> I thought everybody knew that. Not the Foreign Office. <laughs> five? Uh, five. There's the charge of the Light Brigade excuse. It was an unfortunate lapse by an individual which has now been dealt with under internal disciplinary procedures. <laughs> and that covers everything? Well, just about everything so far. <laughs> Even walls? Yeah, small walls. Broadcasting from Brisbane, Australia, this is The FOMO Show. I'm Matt. And I'm Joe. And this is a fortnightly podcast where we talk about the exciting ideas changing the world today and what might change the world tomorrow. We'll help you stay across what's going on so you don't get the fear of missing out. You can find us at FOMO.show or by searching for The FOMO Show on your platform of choice. And everything in the show is in the show notes. Check those out for links to the stuff we're talking about and timestamps to the relevant parts so you can always skip ahead or just find stuff later. This episode, we're going to be talking about what's going on in Africa. So we'll be continuing Mm. our geopolitics series and we're going to really hone in on the continent of Africa and talk Mm. about all the different things that are going on there on the African continent. Yeah, and we've got a bunch of news. We've got some cryptocurrency news, which is kind of interesting. And we've also got a little bit on transport news, some updates from SpaceX and uh, Virgin Hyperloop One. Um, So yeah, lots to look forward to. So what have you been up to, mate? Mate, I've had my first week back at work on uh, after my holiday, and it has been remarkably unproductive. Um, yes, yeah, so that's been exciting, just planning a, an event for our new office. We're moving into our new office soon, so I've got to start um, planning a launch party. So that's exciting. Um, other news, I've lost access to one of my crypto wallets because I don't know where I put the password. So your, your private key, which you use to access your crypto wallet you you just can't find it yeah it's just for one of these altcoins that i have and um i've got security measures in place unfortunately it was so secure that um i have no idea where it is so (laughs) you've protected it from yourself torture me all you like i have no idea where it is (laughs) (laughs) maybe that's a capital loss then do you know what I'm, I'm thinking? I may have to declare that. Um, although it didn't fall in the old financial year, so it would only apply maybe next tax year. I don't know how it works. Mm. It's all confusing. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, it's like shredding as well, isn't it? Like <laughs> until, you, until the wallet's lost, is it lost or not lost? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you know what? It made me realise that crypto custody services – are going to be so important in the future if crypto yep. does take off in the way that many of us think it will. Yep. So, yeah, I reckon there's a big old market there for just crypto custody for the everyday man or woman, um, for the everyday person. I look forward to hopefully that will be something the banks can do for once. Awesome. Yeah. And you've also been reading a book, haven't you? Oh, yeah, I've been flicking through a book called Powerful Radio. It's like a – I picked it up. It's It must be from the 90s or something because it looks ancient. But um, it's really kind of interesting. It's written by some radio people in the US, I think it is. And, um, yeah, they just do all kinds of advice on how to do morning shows and things like that. So, yeah, I just found it a really interesting read. So I've just been flicking through some of the tips from that. Loads of little ideas there, which are actually really important. So I was just reading a chapter on how to run a morning show on radio now – we don't run a radio station. We don't have a morning show. But, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Just 
little things like, you know, first thing in the morning, people don't really want to be getting into deep subjects or, you know, staying on one topic for too long. So just switch between things real fast and keep it light and keep it, make it happy because most people hate their mornings. So it was just mm. really interesting little principles. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What have you been up to, mate? Look, I'm not too much. I've just been working, looking after our new daughter. Yeah. Um, we did a fair bit of travelling on the weekend. Mm. Um, I've been reading through uh, a number of submissions and different things on the uh, AA Act or AA Bill, which came in here in Australia. Yeah. Um, and that bill, yeah, and that, that's the anti-encryption bill, as it's known? Uh, it's well. It's just it's been called the anti encryption bill. It's it's, it's named the assistance and access bill, Ooh, which very is nice. which is very friendly. Yeah. Um, but uh, well. what it does is not very friendly at all. Uh, so as usual, our legislation gets named to uh, with a bit of double speak in mind. Mm, but mm. Um, yeah, there's been submissions made by the Department of Home Affairs, who are you know the essentially the Nazis of Australia, <laughs> um, trying to enforce. <laughs> No, they're not that bad, but they're up there. Um, they've essentially said that, you know, they've done nothing wrong and that everything's good and they'd actually like a bit more power. So oh. we'll see what other people have submissions for. I'm hoping the EFF are going to put together a submission soon and there's uh, there's a number of inquiries going on about it. But, yeah, just, just interesting to see people's perspectives and there's a number of companies that have come out and said it's really affecting them on the world stage and wow. uh, they're having trouble securing business because international companies don't want to do business with them anymore because of the legislation. So, uh, yeah. I, I saw um, on a webpage today on the, one of the Australian government websites saying myths about the assistance and access bill and it was saying one of the myths is that it could damage or harm any Australian business. <laughs> uh, they yeah, said that was a complete myth and there's no way that that can possibly <laughs> happen. So, yeah, crazy yeah, in, talk. I mean, in, in this submission, <laughs> they, um, they, they even went so far as to say they think it increases the security of Australian businesses, oh, boy. Um, <laughs> which is absolutely <laughs> preposterous, you know, but it, it just shows that there's – either there's a willful disregard for what the legislation actually means yeah. or the people who are making it are just that disconnected with reality uh, that they actually think this stuff is helping. Um, look, it sounds about right. <laughs> I mean, look, so, these people are living in the middle of it. Like they're, they're not living in any kind of major city. They're in our capital, which is not Sydney, funnily enough. Mm, and they're mm. all getting paid way more than the average. So how can you possibly like, look at things sensibly when you well, get, yeah, I you're mean, just I, not I, even, I, there's no way you're a regular person? You're completely right because here in Australia, we've got a, a city that's basically just made for for government like there's it doesn't mm. really do anything else it didn't really exist before we had a federal government mm. um and so all our politicians go and live there for six months of the year away from the population who ostensibly they're meant to represent and <laughs> uh it, it, it just leads to a complete detachment from reality you know there, there's mm. no accountability there's no real grounding and mm. uh yeah it's just you can see it more and more in the way that these politicians are becoming i guess more and more like a ruling class mm. you know like 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 the ruling classes back in the um the monarchy days and the you know other different societies where the class just stays that apart from everyone else mm. that they just become completely out of touch with what's actually going on. So do you know what? You made a really good point though. Just, just like the really, really, really quickly, just saying that this city is entirely for government. That's, that's yeah. all it's there for. And so all like you finish work and you go to a bar and who are you chatting to? People from the government. Yeah. It's like a massive feedback. Loop. Like it's just, you're surrounded. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we talked about yeah, it. It's I, I guess it's, it's funny. We, we talked about a similar thing with how people are consuming the internet last episode, didn't we? How yeah. we have Reddit and we have mm. Google News and Facebook and all sorts of things and all of these new tools to interpret the internet. So we're not just going to a website anymore and reading directly from the website. We're getting like a curated list and experience for the way we interact with the internet. And that generally mm. leads to this feedback loop where you're essentially getting reinforcement from all your information sources that your view is right and you get more pigeonholed into your specific views, you know, as you, as you curate that more. Mm. And it's, it's probably very similar with these politicians and career bureaucrats and everyone else who's involved in this apparatus of government, particularly federal government. I think federal governments 
the worst and then it comes back in in layers as you come back down the the scale but yeah like they they thought it was a really good idea back in the day to have a dedicated federal city where all the federal politicians mm. went but that yeah makes sense. but it's you know in reality i think it's created an insular community of government mm. bureaucrats and politicians and you know that they can just do their own thing well, what do you reckon if you're listening? Uh, jump into our Telegram, show slash Telegram, and um, send us a thought. Is having a government city a great <laughs> idea? <laughs> a bit of disclosure. Uh, Matt, is this podcast investment or any other type of advice? In a word, no, Joe. Uh, we're not saying you should buy anything at all, and we're not advising you to buy anything at all. So full disclosure, we're both personally invested in different shares, funds, and cryptocurrencies, some of which we talk about on this show. But if we talk about an investment product, it doesn't mean you should buy it. So do your own research, never invest more than you can afford to lose, and most of all, avoid the fear of missing out. If you're new around here and need a blockchain and cryptocurrency, you can check out our Blockchain Basics series. It starts from episode two and continues on until about episode eight. Yeah, it'll give you a bit of a grounding in some of the stuff we're talking about and, yeah, just help you understand a bit about the fundamentals. All right, let's get into the news. So first bit of news, uh, this one comes from Brave New Coin and they've done a survey and found out that only one in ten people really get cryptocurrency. Yeah, so a new report that was published sheds light on the state of crypto adoption. Now, the report says that the majority of the public still has a very limited understanding of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So a total of 13,000-odd respondents in 22 countries were polled for the data, and they've essentially said that blockchain and cryptocurrencies are difficult, complex concepts to grasp. There's a steep learning curve as well as the fast-evolving nature make it quite confusing for non-technical individuals. Yeah, that is... That is a very fair mm. point. I mean, you don't even need to do research to, to say that. But yeah, the complexity of this tech isn't lost on the market. So um, Kaspersky reports that only one in 10, 10% of people they surveyed say that they fully understand how cryptocurrencies work, while 45% said they've heard of the concept, but don't know how it works. And I mean, you and I, you know this from just chatting to uh, chatting to people that mm. we meet. A lot of people are just like, I don't fully get what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. It, look, it, I mean, it took us quite a long time when we first got into it to to grasp it, and I feel like even now, I still, I get it at a at a high level, but you can go down some really really deep rabbit holes, and yeah, um, I, I'd say even one in ten saying they fully understand how cryptocurrencies work. I'd say probably only 5% of those 10% people can actually say they fully understand how cryptocurrencies work because it's just so complex. It's very, very technical. Mm. It's a question for someone like Craig Wright, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, what, no what, what I mean to say, though, is like, I mean, there's there are so many descriptions, but I, the, the key points that I guess stand out to me, and I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as well, but are the fact that it's a distributed ledger, so nobody fully controls mm. it. It's a bunch of people hold the copies of this entire ledger and once a transaction is made that is almost completely irreversible like it's it's irreversible once a transaction is made it is there forever and can't be taken back which is really really interesting because it means that you can have some trust in where this these ones and zeros, these numbers are moving. Yeah. I mean, I, I generally say there's four pillars to Bitcoin, which is essentially generally the, you know, it's the first blockchain they made. It's kind of the easiest place to start explaining. I generally say there's, there's nodes and blocks. So you've essentially got computers which uh, validate the transactions and then all those transactions get put into a block. It's got mm -hmm. built-in verification, so you've got usernames and passwords, which are your public and private keys, essentially. And every time you send a transaction, you've got to sign it. And mm -hmm. then I say, yeah, it's a distributed ledger, so it's all around the world. And I generally use the example of saying, you know, um, each computer, each node on the network hosts a complete copy of the entire financial ledger. And mm -hmm. uh, there's some of them in space. So because it's distributed, mm -hmm. even if the whole world got wiped out by an EMP or something, the Bitcoin blockchain would still be chugging away there up in space and the moment someone reconnected to it, the whole ledger would be there. So it's it's really, really wow. um, attack resistant because it's so distributed. And mm -hmm. I generally also say, look, there's incentives. So the reason public 
blockchains like Bitcoin work so well is because it's actually more worth your while to do the right thing. If, you, if you're going to try and attack the network, you'll actually make more money by attacking the network and becoming a, a, a genuine node than you would trying to do the wrong thing and reverse transactions. So hmm. there's there's a lot of game theory that goes on there as well. And that's Some like a really high level <laughs> cryptocurrency explanation. Oh, boy. But yeah, check out the Blockchain Basics episodes two until episode eight. Explains it really well. Uh, mm. From what I recall, it would be really cool to revisit that at some point in the future. Yeah. Because um, I don't even recall what it sounds like anymore. It's been that long because we're on episode 48 now. Yeah. 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 I reckon we should we should tee that up maybe after the geopolitics series next piece of news the world's first zero fiat so no regular money bitcoin bond is now available on the bloomberg terminal yeah so this is out of coin telegraph and they say that two european companies have launched what they describe as the first genuine bitcoin bond out of uh luxembourg luxembourg paste com- company argento or argento and the london block exchange And it's a Bitcoin-denominated bond, which is a regulated product under the United Kingdom's regulator. And uh, it's readily available via the Bloomberg Terminal. So it's the first crypto product to have its own ISIN code. Wow. I don't even know what an ISIN (laughs) code, but it sounds super official. Uh, But yeah, various durations are available, they say. So these, these are bonds. So a bond is like a loan, isn't it? Yeah. It's like a loan where you get, what, paid interest back on loaning people money. Yeah, yeah, when you eventually present it. Mm-hmm. And you can trade yeah. bonds with different people. Now, generally, from what I am aware, bonds are relatively low. They have like a an interest rate that's around the same as your bank, maybe a little bit mm-hmm. higher. But yeah, so usually you'd get, you know, you'd get like a government bond, which would be like a loan of, you would loan money to your government and they would give you maybe like a 2% return a year or whatever they yep. give you. And you could get a five-year or 10-year bond. So it's like, yeah, it's kind of like you're yeah, being the mortgage people for the government. Yeah, so, I, I mean, they've said that it's an excellent product for people who currently hold Bitcoin and aren't planning to sell over the next few years. And I'm not mm. sure exactly the way it's going to work. I'm not sure whether there's, you'll get your Bitcoin amount in Bitcoin back at the end of it plus some or whether there's you know, a fixed rate of interest they're giving you on what you're currently investing. But I assume the fact that it's denominated in no feed at all. It's denominated in Bitcoin means that whatever you invest now, you'll get back later, even if that's ex- values mm. significantly expanded on, in relation to like fiat currency. Mm. So anyway. Interesting. Yeah, interesting yeah. to see. I mean, for, for those people that have get a lot of comfort through registered financial products, I guess it's probably a great thing for them. Next piece, millions can't sell their cryptocurrencies due to minimum limits. Now, thanks to Pav, who shouted this one out in our chat. So many of those who have cryptocurrencies valued at less than $100 may soon find they're unable to sell. Some wallet providers have actually been setting dubious limits on their exchange uh, removals that have trapped smaller investors. Yeah, so Telegraph Money reported that one user who'd purchased 0.0062 of a cryptocurrency found out that the minimum to sell was 0.008. And when they checked again, the minimum amount had actually risen to 0.01. Now, blockchain.com said that the reason for the seemingly arbitrary minimums is due to network fees. They had a statement which said, we've evolved minimums (laughs) to ensure that users don't pay uneconomical fees to move small amounts of money money yeah so yeah the the minimum is actually less than what most wallets hold in bitcoin so yeah Mm. i don't know if that's that must be specific to the blockchain.com wallet but i guess the main thing is um hold on that's to withdraw so i'm guessing that's to sell within the blockchain.com platform but i guess what you could probably do is just send it to another wallet and then cash it out on exchange if you really wanted to sell it but um Oh, yikes. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've got to wonder. We've, we've seen this story before with Mt. Gox and some other exchanges that have gone under where the exchange owners are essentially leveraging the uh, funds held in the exchange and doing their own, making their own investments with it and running short positions and all sorts of different things. So you've got to wonder whether this is just 
some of these more dubious exchanges trying to keep as much funds in their exchange as they possibly can mm. so they can use that those funds themselves. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, as an aside, I forgot to mention, that's one other thing I've been up to this week is I've been buying my um, coffees. I buy a coffee in the mornings. I've been buying that with uh, Bitcoin. I've actually been using Lightning, which is that super suspicious Bitcoin um, scaling mechanism that basically moves Bitcoin into like something else called lightning and then you can send it super fast and it's got really low fees and all that sort of stuff so it's bitcoin's answer to bitcoin cash which is just a mm. faster version of bitcoin and have you found it oh mate it's been it's been super fast i mean even though i have a vpn on my phone and i go via a different country the it, it it's all I, like the uh, all it, the longest thing is just like getting them to unlock the ipad and then just entering you know the amount dollar amount for my coffee but yeah, I just scan a QR code and click OK, and it's just as fast as using my um, Visa. Awesome. Mm. So, that, so I mean, it's because uh, my understanding with Lightning is they're still developing it, but it sounds like you know, as a layer two, it's it's kind of serving its purpose. Well, it works because yeah, I've been buying my coffee with it, and the coffee tastes especially delicious <laughs> because it's internet coffee. It's internet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and because that money I didn't invest, I just put yeah. it there for cash. You know, it just you know, there's no tax um, things to worry about with that. So, oh, it's great, awesome. absolutely love it. Yes, uh, exciting times. And that's with the uh, wallet of Satoshi. Is that what you've been using? Yeah, I've been. I use the wallet. Yeah, the wallet of Satoshi app. It's a beautiful Bitcoin wallet for your mobile, and it's really it's like really well designed, really simple. You just send Bitcoin to there. The most expensive thing about it is sending your Bitcoin in the first place because you got to pay a network fee to send yeah. your Bitcoin. But once it's there, instead of the default unit in the app is actually Satoshi's. So uh, I think isn't that one one hundred thousandth of a Bitcoin, or is it? Or is it one million? It could be a millionth. Yeah, one of the two. Yeah. It's 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 very small. Yeah, but yeah, it's 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 pretty crazy. Yeah, one Satoshi is not point not 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 one. That did not answer my question. But um, yeah, crazy, tiny amount of Bitcoin. You can send it real fast. So yeah, random. So in line with that, uh, Max Kaiser, who is uh, one of the early. Uh, investors in Bitcoin and a known Bitcoin bull. He said that mm. the altcoin phenomenon is finished and most of the value in this next quote unquote bull run will flow into Bitcoin. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, he was, he said that the development of the crypto space and the adoption of, you know, uh, SegWit, which is um, uh, Bitcoin addition and the lightning protocol, um, you know, people began to better understand the store of value that Bitcoin offers, um, as well as scaling that would happen off chain. So this, according to him, made crypto owners move their funds back into, quote unquote, the most secure chain, uh, Bitcoin. So Kaiser's further projected that altcoins are going to the pennies uh, or even out of existence because all that cash is going to flow into Bitcoin. And he actually sees Bitcoin dominance going up to around 80 or 90% potentially. Wow. Um, because there has been this discussion and everyone's kind of saying, oh, when's the next altcoin bull run going to happen? And when are people, when's money going to flow back into alts? And most people are thinking it's going to be like the last bull run where a whole bunch of money f f flowed into all these different currencies and we saw crazy, crazy speculation. But look, to, to be to be honest, like uh, right now, I mean, we've been seeing increased activity in Bitcoin for a few months now and mm -hmm. there hasn't really been that you know, altcoin summer, I guess some people are calling it. Like there hasn't been a lot of extra money flowing into altcoins yeah, like right. we saw last time. Mm. Do you know, I am I tend to agree with him in most ways, as in like compared to most cryptocurrencies, I think most, like a lot of people have joined the market, bought into a lot of these altcoins and then have just been absolutely pained when they found mm. that they didn't work out well. Mm. I mean, I for sure was, I didn't even own Bitcoin until um, a sh uh, like more recently. But yeah, a lot of these altcoins have dropped a lot, but at the same time, as much as Bitcoin is growing, and I think Bitcoin, it seems like it's going to be around for a fair while, I personally believe that the privacy coins are going to continue to grow, continue and continue. I think it's going to solidify into a smaller number of privacy coins. So Monero particularly, you've got Zcash, you've got Pivx, you've, you've got uh, Z, Z, I think it's Zcoin or Z, uh, one of mm. those ones. But I, I really feel like... it. 
it would actually be a great episode for the podcast where I might actually just go and see what a lot of these dark net markets use mm. as their top currencies, list them out because those I think are going to, regardless of how the rest of crypto adoption moves, those privacy coins I think are going to keep growing. Yeah. I mean, it's looking more and more like the whole store of value thing for Bitcoin is coming true. It's, it's looking like Bitcoin's probably going to continue on as being the reserve currency of crypto and um, mm-hmm. people are going to continue to invest in it as the secure chain and then there'll be these offshoots. I mean, I recently have been using Bitcoin Cash for some of my day-to-day mm. payments just because I don't want to pay the fees on Bitcoin and a number of people don't take Lightning. Mm. And that's been working really well, but I'm not sure. Like I still see Bitcoin as, for me, the long-term play, you know. Yeah, I completely agree though. I mean, the Bitcoin came, Bitcoin got adoption in the dark nets. Dash came out of dark nets. Monero's had mm. similar. And particularly with something like Libra coming along, you may actually see like, uh, you know, the the majority of the population may start using Libra or something similar for their transactional mm-hmm. currency, mm-hmm. but then there'll always be the privacy and security enthusiasts, the hackers, the dark net guys and the guys that just don't want to be monitored that are going to look for something else that's a mm. bit more mm. uh, private. Yeah. And that's not going to go away. It's true. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Because your Bitcoin is not anonymous. No. No, I mean, there's talks about Lightning being anonymous, though. Yeah. But um, then, the, and I, I'm not sure of the technicals behind that, but a number of publications I've seen have said that Lightning will be a lot more anonymous than Bitcoin mm. um, in the way that it's all handled. So it's actually quite a good privacy layer. But yeah, without looking into all that, I, I can't be certain. And I don't think it's baked in the same way that Monero and Pivx and Cloakcoin yeah, and all those guys yeah, yeah, bake it directly in on chain. So, mm, mm. yeah. Uh, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, We're gonna have yeah, to I do think a- both of us are quite confident that privacy coins are going to continue to grow, mm. especially as people try and take want to take money out of China and other countries and people want to stay private in their dealings. Because as soon as I send you Bitcoin, we're suddenly sharing a lot of our wallet histories yeah. um, from then on, which is – Bit of a concern now. Mm. Depends on oh, what do you rate. If, if you have a thought on that, just drop it into our Telegram chat. We'd be, love to hear your thoughts on privacy coins and which privacy coins you think might be really interesting. Because I've heard stuff about Grin and other stuff, but yeah, we'll have to keep listening. So another bit of crypto news: uh, re- UK regulators have actually approved the first cryptocurrency hedge fund. Yeah, so Prime Factor Capital was the first crypto hedge fund approved as a full-scope alternative investment fund manager by the Financial Conduct Authority, which is uh, the UK watchdog, according to Bloomberg. So though approved by the UK watchdog, the firm will abide by European regulations at this point, and they'll be allowed to hold more than 100 million euros in assets under management. So it's going to be the first agency to be approved to invest exclusively in the cryptocurrency asset class. Yeah, so the founders actually believe that by focusing on a single asset class, even one that carries a lot of distrust in the regular financial markets, they're actually going to surge ahead of their global competitors and become the trusted authority, or so they say. So the firm manages funds for professionals and institutional investors, including a lot of high net worth in, in uh, individuals. And there's no information available publicly regarding their in- investment strategy, but they've got guys from BlackRock, Legal and General, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank, and a number of other of, of the big names. Wow, yikes. Of course they're going to have ex-Deutsche Bank people because didn't Deutsche <laughs> Bank just fire 18,000 people this yeah, week? Yeah, I part saw of that. Yeah, they're, they're across, across their entire global workforce they're getting rid of eighteen thousand people my deutsche bank is like it's a piece it's it's literally just a uh people playing catch with a you know like in the old dis like the old cartoons of people playing catch with a big old bomb mm. <laughs> the fuse just burning up that's deutsche bank i i'm so <laughs> sure of it i mean you look at their exposure to oh, a lot of mate. financial risk especially in the derivatives market oh. now if that's not something that you've looked into before google deutsche bank derivatives exposure and it is a red pill into f- real financial risk yeah and then look up derivatives in general <laughs> As far as risk goes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look at that exposure and then just, yeah, just, just, uh, yeah. Oh, Google have actually completely erased Zero Hedge from the mm. first page of that. 
Huh. There you go. Although if you – oh, no, the Financial Times actually covers it. If you just go Deutsche Bank derivatives exposure, click on images, you can see a graph that shows you the size of the German GDP, the size of the European Union GDP, and then Deutsche Bank's gross derivatives exposure, and it's terrifying. Anyway, that is a nice little red pill. I'll leave you with that. Is that right? Google's completely removed Sierra Hedge from their search listings. Oh, well, at least for that. that uh, when I used to Google the exact same search term, Deutsche Bank derivatives exposure, um, Zero Hedge would actually appear there. Mm. But uh, I'm guessing they're probably on page two, which means – but oh, yeah. Uh, they're actually on page two, and right. I'm pretty sure I heard a search engine optimization expert say a couple of years ago, he said, if you want to hide a dead body, hide it on page two of Google. <laughs> so, yeah, do, um, Zero Edge is getting purged. <laughs> oh, sounds, anyway, on to the next uh, one. The censorship. <laughs> So next bit of news, uh, Nestle has actually announced a new blockchain initiative which is separate from the ongoing uh, IBM uh, Food Trust project which we've covered quite regularly on the show. Yeah, so Nestle, the largest food company in the world by revenue, announced a pilot program to track its supply chains using blockchain according to a company statement. So the firm's partnered with OpenSC which is a blockchain platform to develop a distributed ledger system uh, which will be distinct from the Food Trust blockchain and the pilot's going to last for six months. So they're going to determine success of this pilot by, quote, the feasibility, viability and scalability of the system. And uh, once rolled out, the service will probably involve QR codes, mobile apps, web portals, but uh, all the different things that we've come to expect with enterprise applications. Yeah, so they said it's to drive the market towards transparency and providing independently verifiable data to their consumers. And, yeah, they believe it's going to improve safety and control. But, yeah, initially the program is going to track milk from farms in New Zealand to Nestle facilities in the Middle East, and then it will expand to include palm oil production in the Americas. And, yeah, they'll, they'll then determine and how scalable the application is, noting that some retail items will take a bit longer to integrate. Because I guess you've got to build that into the packaging and the printing. And mm. Because at the end of the day, if they're saying it's for these end consumers, I'm guessing that means your Nestle packaging is going to have some kind of a QR code that you can scan as a customer and somehow get the information out of it of where that specific bit of milk that was in your chocolate came from or whatever it is. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall of the Nestle officers when they talked about doing this because it's hard to know whether they're doing this because they want to kind of get themselves out of IBM's ecosystem or if they just want to do this for something new that IBM is not currently delivering. Great point. That is a very good point. Because if you're Nestle, I mean, if you're, you're the, you are the biggest food manufacturer by revenue and hmm. IBM's charging you millions and millions of dollars to use their system, it may be more financially viable for you just to develop your own. Hmm. It's, that's, that's a good point, although it must cost a fair amount. Yeah. So next little clip, um, it's a video. Uh, now, Emirates NBD, which is one of the largest banking groups in the Middle East, actually made a video, a music video, called It Wasn't Me. And uh, they did it in collaboration with the Dubai police. And it gives you the do's and don'ts of keeping your identity and account secure at all times. And I saw that came across this on Reddit of um, the reaction to when you get hacked. And it's a great little music video. Uh, it's, it's based on that video. Is it Shaggy who yeah. did It Wasn't Me? Yeah. It is brilliant. Take a listen to a little clip from it. Oh, man. Hello? Can you help me, man? Sure. How can I help you? My account just got wiped. You must be joking. I don't know how I let this happen. By who? Some guy. <laughs> you, you know? Man, I don't know what to do. It wasn't me. All right. <laughs> Hello, email me. Dear customer, there seems to be a payment issue. You need to send us your account. It's even got little karaoke tiles on it. <laughs> How could I be so clumsy and click on the previous link? All this time he was after my password and user. Look at the old guy. I want to send the access to your data. Hackers on the floor is always lying in the waiter. You better watch your back. Let's review the situation that you caught up in. To be a safe player, you have to know how to play. If you say a moment, don't give him time a day. His voice, mate. Oh. It's so real. It's so it good. It's exactly like Shaggy. 
but he sent me a reminder. It wasn't me. Message me on. It wasn't me. So tell me your thoughts, mate. That was unreal. That was so well done. Um, it was p- great. Yeah, like I, you know, it was like obviously it was a little bit corny, but I, I don't think I've ever seen a better video for like getting the message across. Yeah. Because you could just show that to every employee and, you know, people could kind of be like, they, you know, next time a link comes up, they'll think of the song. Mm. Mm. That was brilliant. That's actually such a good point. Yeah. So, I mean, th- this is written by a bank, but just as relevant for cryptocurrency enthusiasts as well. So, loved it. Thought you'd enjoy that. So, yeah. On to the next piece. So, next bit of news, uh, SpaceX. Um, their Starship is going to carry... According to Elon Musk, a thousand people anywhere on Earth for a cost of between five hundred dollars to two thousand dollars. Yeah, so Elon Musk tweeted that he's actually looking at that number of passengers for point to point travel because it will be a twenty minute flight on a fully reusable engine, and then the ticket cost would actually be yeah five hundred to a thousand per person apparently. But um, it will feel like a roller coaster, he says. But uh, you'll exit on another continent. And we were talking about this off air a couple of days ago um i think when when you put the news this bit of news up actually i just messaged you straight away and was like this is wild mm. but it's it's because we're, we're saying you know at the moment you jump on the plane and to get around to another continent it can take you 10 20 hours in a plane flight it's not that comfortable but you know at least you're, you're still relatively secure you're not going to be sick generally or anything like that whereas this mm. it's like you jump in a rocket it shoots you up at ridiculous speeds into the stratosphere and then lands you again. Uh, so you go through, you know, you go up and then you do re-entry as well. You land in about 20 minutes and it's like a permanent roller coaster for those 20 minutes. So you're not comfortable at all. You're probably being sick. But at the end of the day, it's just 20 minutes of that and then you're literally around the other side of the world. It's abs- it's it's absolutely insane. Like I think he said something like, um, "Yeah, so all the seats would be coach. There'd be no business or furs. There's a pilot area. There's, there's no pilot area or food gallery that's needed because most of it's automated. And um, yeah, most flights would be only fifteen to twenty minutes. It's basically, he said, it's an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, traveling at Mach twenty five that actually lands as opposed to." <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's great. And I guess they'd have to get the, the the safety really, really sorted before people probably think of doing this. But, yeah, I guess the question is, you know, are you willing to put up with 20 minutes of being very, very uncomfortable instead of 20 to 24 hours of not being so comfortable but, you know, maybe not throwing up? And, and what, so, what's more valuable to you? My question, when's the last time you travelled to Europe from Australia? Uh, me? It would, would have been uh, about f- four years ago. So how was your flight? It sucked, man. Yeah? Yeah, it's just long. I had, to, I had to stop over in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. One of the stops was like eight hours. I went down to the toilets. and. So I guess you flew with Etihad? I flew with Etihad. I uh, flew with – and the other one I flew with – uh, Emirates, Emirates. Dubai, yeah. I, guess. yeah. I just remember like I wanted to go to the toilet, but over there they wash themselves after they've been to the toilet with like a, a hose. And so I was trying to find yeah. a, a toilet that wasn't completely sopping wet and I just couldn't find one. Oh. Yeah, and it just the whole experience, like it was great when I got there, great when I got home, but even in a nice airport with a, with a decent layover, there were still things I hated. Dude, like abs- I, I'm 100% with you. I discovered a photo of me just after getting off the flight from Australia back to England. Uh, this is about eight years ago now, yeah. no, seven years ago now, but – my hair was just pure grease because I'd been on a flight, like I'd been traveling door to door for 36 hours oh. and it was filth, like filthy. Yeah. And the idea that I can have 20 minutes of terror where I'm not sure if I live or die and I pay a thousand or even $2,000, I would pay you so much money <laughs> to like, because the thing is when you're on that long flight, you, do, you have, unless you're in business class, you get limited foot like foot range. I'm sure a lot of our listeners can agree with that. Yeah. You get limited leg room 
And by the time the flight ends and everyone starts standing up before the seatbelt sign goes off and it takes you another X amount of time to get off the plane and you're raging, like internally for me at least, I was raging so mad because I just, ah, oh, horrible. So yeah, SpaceX, save us. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I guess one thing I'm looking forward to is the fact that there's no business class or first class. So we get to like, you'll, you'll get to see these people who for business reasons or for you know, personal <laughs> reasons are traveling SpaceX, but they've got to slum it with the rest of us. And like, you get to watch oh. them be uncomfortable and you get to watch them throw yes. up and make a mess of themselves. Perfect. When normally Perfect. they'd be up the front sipping their espresso martini. Oh, you know, like, would you like a champagne, yeah, sir? Yes, yeah, watching on their big Disc. widescreen yeah. TV. Um, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I like roller coasters anyway. So 20 minutes of roller coaster. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, you could either get a ticket to a theme park and stay yeah. in your little area or you can get a ticket to a SpaceX rocket and get the longest roller coaster in the world. Mm, I'd take a window seat on that. Yes, definitely. Because I mean, and there's no, there's literally, there's no need for masks if there's a problem. There's no need for parachutes because you're dead. <laughs> like <Yeah>. it's <laughs> crazy, right. crazy, crazy, crazy. On um on the uh, the uh, the crazy transportation topic, uh, Virgin Hyperloop One has kicked off its US road trip. So they are, um, if you haven't come across Hyperloop, it is an idea that Elon Musk had. It was his shower thought that he tweeted about and put a little white paper out. But basically, it's just a, a big, long tube, like a garden hose, but big enough to put a bunch of people in. It's got low pressure, and you just have little pods that would just shoot super fast through these things, way faster than trains and other things. But yeah, this mass transit system is being presented to state and local governments and stakeholders, including those in Ohio, Missouri, and Texas, where feasibility studies are ongoing. So th this uh, roadshow is essentially designed to show it off to these different places um, and uh, it kicked off in Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., where they presented the technology and viable routes, routes to members of Congress and federal stakeholders in its event, Hyperloop on the Hill. And they claim the technology is going to transport passengers and goods three times as fast as high-speed rail and enable regional cities to connect just as local city subways connect to neighbourhoods. Mm. So what do you reckon this would do to things like property prices and um, and to, like, I mean, in fact, even to answer the question, your commute to work? Well, yeah, I, like it would it would make a living in the regions I want to live in much more feasible, I think. If, if, you, could, mm. if you could just drive to your regional centre and jump on the Hyperloop and get the Hyperloop and get shot straight to the city... I definitely think there would be a lot less of a premium put on living close to the city than there is mm. now if, if, if they were able to build these and, and build these quite widely and to hook up quite a number of different networks because there mm. just wouldn't be that transport time anymore. And mm. I, look, I think, it, I think another thing it may do is it may also play into the whole automated future and, and people maybe not having to own cars and things like that anymore because you think about it, mm. you know, you could drive your car to a location and spend, oh, who knows, maybe like let's say, let's say for argument's sake three hours driving somewhere for holidays or you could drive mm. your car to the local Hyperloop station, which is 10 minutes, jump on the Hyperloop, get shot to the location in maybe 20 minutes and then just rent a car when you're there. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that's, there's, that's there'll probably be a wow. number of flow-on effects if they did do it. Mm. Mm. Now, what we don't know is how expensive it's all going to be and mm -hmm. it could be really expensive and no one could build it. But, yeah, it's it's definitely compelling because cities are getting really, really built up and it's it, it, you'd have to present it as a cost-saving measure in the long term. Mm -hmm. You could see, like, yeah, San Francisco, that would really change that place. Yeah. And L.A., I hear that there's terrible traffic there. So yeah. that plus, you know, the tunnels that Tesla are building, pretty crazy. Next piece of news, new electric cars in Europe have to make artificial noises. Yes, this is a really wild one. This is from Engadget. The uh, European Union have said that the system is going to need to alert pedestrians at slow speeds that vehicles are coming because most of these electric cars don't actually make enough noise for people to be able to hear them. So as of July the 1st, new four-wheeled electric vehicle models in the European Union, they require a noise-emitting device, which 
kicks in whenever the vehicle is driving below 19 kilometers an hour. Um, so the system will theoretically prevent pedestrians and cyclists from being caught unawares by cars that would otherwise be near silent. Yeah, it's not a particularly irksome sound, but it could stop you from crossing the street when there's a less than attentive driver. Do you know what I worry about, though? That number is 19 kilometers an hour, which is basically crawling. Yeah. And why would you need to admit noise when you're basically crawling when... If I if somebody crosses the street and you're going at 19 kilometers an hour, it's not even going to damage them. Nah, and you've got plenty of time to stop too. Like if you're only going 90 kilometers an hour, um, yeah, you'll you'll generally have a lot more <clears throat> leeway than um, than something that's going you know 50 or 60 kilometers an hour. I don't Why know. Why didn't they set it like 50 kilometers an hour? Because something like that kind of makes sense because that would be most roads, yep. which is the types of places that pedestrians are going to be crossing where the, it's a 50 kilometer an hour zone. Like no one, I've I, like unless you're walking through a car park. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think this is this is another case of where we, we, the, the solution being proposed is is coming at it from the wrong way. What 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 the the more sensible solution for this would be to start installing sensors in the lead up to uh, areas where people are crossing hmm. and alert pedestrians if there's a car coming. That's not a bad idea. That, you know, that's 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 something that, that would probably make a lot more sense if you're going to go to the expense of making, sure, making everyone have to fit these, you know, noise emitting devices or whatever, instead just put that money into, you know, just building some sensors that says... Mm. If there's a car within 200 metres of a crossing, just let the – maybe have that a bit of noise to say to the person mm. that's about to cross the road, hey, there's a car coming. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that was the news. Yeah. So this week uh, we're continuing on our geopolitics series and we're going to be focusing on one of our favourite places in the emerging world in Africa. Yeah. So we're going to start with two news articles and then just to a deep dive into interesting things that are going on in Africa economically. So first bit of news, Google and Facebook are circling Africa with a huge undersea cable to get millions online. Yeah, so with internet penetration rates on the continent estimated at about an average of 24%, it remains the only continent where over half the total population is without internet access. Yet that stat represents some significant improvement given in 2005 internet connections stood at about 2.1% of the African population. Yeah, so in percentage terms, Africa's actually recorded the highest growth in internet use globally between uh, 2005 and 2018, um, and they've reached a significant global internet usage milestone. So these two uh, companies, Google and Facebook, are trying to make sure that growth continues. Yeah, so Facebook is reportedly working on plans for Simba, named after the Lion King cartoon character, which is an underwater cable that will circle the continent with landings on multiple coasts. It's similar to undersea cable projects that they've undertaken in Europe and Asia, and it's unclear whether they will partner with African telecoms or not, especially for funding. Google's underwater cable plans are a lot further along than Facebook, so, and it's confirmed constructions of plans for a cable connecting Portugal and South South Africa, with the first phase due to be completed by 2021. Wow. Now, the new cables named Equino, uh, after the 18th century Nigerian writer and abolitionist, Aloda, Aloda Aquino, I'm probably butchering that, um, and it'll have 20 times the capacity of the most recent projects laid in the region. The first branch is going to be out in Nigeria, which is Africa's largest internet market, and the project will be fully Funded by Google. Wow. And they're not doing that out of the goodness of their hearts, <laughs> I reckon we should add. But the big picture, as Quartz magazine is saying for these companies, is that the deployment of high capacity fiber optic cables will ultimately improve connectivity and likely make internet costs much cheaper, allowing more Africans to get and stay connected. So for Google and Facebook, the tens of millions of people who will come al online as a result also represent a larger target market sorry, a larger target market for their ever-growing cache of products and advertising services. Mm. So here's another interesting one. The West African nations have unveiled a single currency without blockchain. Yeah, so the 15 member nations of ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, have agreed to launch ECO, a quote-unquote common currency similar to the method the EU uses. 
So Ico is expected to make its debut in January 2020, and it's an attempt to create more frictionless trade. And West African leaders are hoping to give that it will give a much-needed boost to many of the smaller economies in the region. So which countries are part of this ECOWAS economic community of West African states? So we've got Cape Verde, Verde. Uh, we've got Gambia, Guinea, uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Liberia, Mali, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Benin, Burkina Faso, Ghana, the Ivory Coast, and uh, Niger, Nigeria, and um, Togo. Yeah, and if you haven't heard of a number of them, that's part of the the motivation, I think, behind them building this economic zone is they really want to give a number of these smaller nations which don't really have the clout to play on the international stage a bit of a leg up and build essentially an economic block through which they can leverage and trade more, similar to the way that employees form themselves into unions to get more bargaining power. It's really worth noting that for maybe 50% of these countries, their currently their official currency is the CFA franc, which is actually underwritten uh, or guaranteed by the, um, I believe it's guaranteed by the, yeah, it's guaranteed by the French treasury. Wow. So, um, because France have had days like England and, and colonialized a bunch of countries. But yes, yeah, so they've already got a bunch of different currencies. So you've got the franc, the Delassi, the Escudo, the dollar, the Leon. And yeah, so what they're trying to do is create a unified currency, the eco, amongst them. Yeah. So, I mean, the crypto community was quick to jump on this and say, well, look, it's not a digital currency and it's not built on a blockchain. And they're exactly right. I mean, it's just a regular old fiat currency and there's no indication that they might incorporate any kind of real new digital currency technology. Yeah. Do you know, I've got some concerns with this. So I am from a, a country that is still in the European Union, um, the United Kingdom. And mm. what you notice with the EU, they bought in their euro currency, which it takes a bunch of different countries with different qualities. So you've got Greece, France, Germany, Austria, all these different places. And all of these countries are very different economically, population-wise, all these kinds of things. And they decided, okay, let's just put the same currency in all of these countries. And they one day they just switched over. So they had from going to the franc to having the euro. And in some places in Europe, they literally just took one for one, and they said, okay, well, it was previously one, I don't know, X currency, and now we're going to make it the euro. So they literally just changed the, the currency symbol. However, so initially there was a lot of craziness because some for some people the prices had actually rocketed, for some people it had dropped. And yeah. to have vastly different countries on the exact same currency – in some ways is really dangerous. I mean, you saw that with the European Union problems with Greece, mm. where Greece went bankrupt and they had the... the. There's a long story in that worth looking up the Troika and yeah. all that financial history. But having Greece, which is a, a completely different economy to Germany's... Where and, and, who, and who benefited from the bankruptcy too? Oh, well, let's, yeah, let's, not, let's not talk about Germany, <laughs> France and uh, other European countries. Let's just ignore that. Yeah. But... These some countries have been completely screwed by that, and yeah, it's crazy, but really interesting because it would enable what easier trade between countries when people travel around, and more people are going to be traveling, more people are going to be moving around. So, what do you reckon? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I agree. I think it's it's a little bit worrying. I also would have loved to have seen them try and be a little bit more forward with the with. The digital aspect, but again, it's really tough because Africa just doesn't have that much internet penetration, as we said. So they do still have to deal a bit more in the bricks and mortar. They don't have; not everyone has a smartphone, not everyone has internet. But look, I, th I think it, uh, on the on the positive side, these countries are trying to give themselves a bit more bargaining power to try and um, to try and play a bit more on the international stage. Now, whether that will filter down to the everyday person on the street, it remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess, uh, like you say, it's just a bit worrying that they're modelling it on the EU, I guess. Mm. Uh, and hopefully there's been some lessons learnt there and they're not doing everything exactly the way that the EU did it. 
So that's just one area of Africa, but we wanted to take a bit of a deeper look into what's actually going on in in Africa in general. And there's been a number of reports done, and we're going to be relying on several reports we've found. Some of them have come out of the UN, some have come out of the Financial Times' uh, data arm, which is FDI, and they paint a really interesting picture of what's actually going on in Africa and the, the places where money's flowing in and the places where money's coming out and who's investing where. And there's, there's, a, there's a number of different point data points and we'll link the reports in the show notes so you can go and really dig into some of these reports and see the data for yourself because a number it's presented in pictures. But mm. there's some great stats around Africa's development in a number of different areas that are, that are shown by these reports. So let's start with foreign direct investment flows in the the top countries in Africa that are receiving investment um, from abroad. So Egypt leads the way by far with about $7.4 billion in um, 2017 in direct in foreign direct investment. You've got Nigeria that follows that with $3.5 billion. Morocco following that with... Um, oh, no, sorry, Ethiopia following that with $3.6 billion. Then Morocco... Uh, and Ghana um, with, yeah, um, 2.7 and 3.3 billion respectively. So th- these countries have a huge amount of potential there. Yeah, and what really struck me about that was the fact that South Africa wasn't higher up on the list. Their in foreign uh, direct investment in 2017 was only about, um, it was in the 1 billion to 1.9 billion range. So it didn't even top over $2 billion, which is, Quite a change from the old days where South Africa was receiving a lot of foreign investment and was really kind of a hub for Africa. Mm. It's worth looking at the outflows. So the the economies that are sending out huge amounts of money abroad in trade and and business. And you can see South Africa leads the way by far with $7.4 billion outflowing. You've actually got following Angola, which is a country I'm a huge fan of, which has got $1.6 billion outflowing, then Nigeria, then Morocco, then Togo. Now, Angola, I'm pretty certain, is leading that simply because of the mineral and resource wealth of Angola. Angola's huge for oil. Right. And Nigeria is also massive for oil as well, but Angola has a huge amount of mineral and oil wealth. They've got a a pretty crazy history as Mm. far as economics and war and... and, uh, Has that war finished in Angola, the civil war? Uh, I'm pretty sure it did, but yeah, Angola used to be, um, uh, it was, uh, Portugal colonised Angola, so Portuguese is actually one of the national languages of Angola, but yeah, it's this, it's one of the countries with the most landmines in the world. It's not up there with Ukraine or Syria or, or a few of these other countries, but um, Angola has a huge amount of landmines left over, so you've actually got Weirdly, I don't know why I know this, but you've got so many amputees in Angola still. Mm. There's a massive disparity between wealthy and poor, but there is so much in wealth under that country. I would not be surprised to see that continue to grow massively as time goes on because there's so much potential and only, you know, the, the capital, I think the capital is Luanda, but yeah, there's, mm. there's some really interesting stuff going on there and it'll be really exciting to watch, uh, especially as their tech industry grows because they've got lots of mineral wealth, but yeah, there's some brilliant, brilliant people there and it's easy for them to integrate with Europe. Yeah. Brilliant. And, and, and that's, there are a lot of uh, countries investing in Africa, but some of the top ones that are investing there's the stats here about the, the billions of dollars that are being invested and the United States leads the way with $57 billion. Uh, United Kingdom's not far behind actually with $55 billion and you've got France. China has seen a massive uptick. So there's stats here from 2011 and 2016 and China's investment, while most other countries have stayed pretty much around the same, both China and Hong Kong in China have uh, more than doubled their investment in mm. Africa within that five-year space. And I dare say that's uh, probably accelerated again between when these stats were last taken and now as mm. China really ramps up their presence in Africa. Mm. Now, South Africa also investing heavily in Af- in other African countries, Italy as well, because they're so close and, you know, with the maritime connections between Italy and Africa. Um, Singapore, surprisingly, a, a lot of investment just after Italy, India uh, and Switzerland. So, yeah. Yeah, wow. It's really 
curious to see the greenfield foreign direct investment projects by the different industries in Africa. So um, greenfield projects are projects that are just like totally starting from scratch, investing in different things. The majority is in services, followed by manufacturing and then going into primary industries. So services, you've actually got business services and um, construction, electricity, gas and water, so various infrastructures, then transport and storage leading the way in foreign direct investment. So building out a lot of the, you know, things like roads and and then electricity, gas and water. So just getting the basics in place, then telecoms and things like that. But following that, you've got manufacturing. So you've got chemicals and chemical products are surprisingly large as far as new projects that have been invested in in Africa. Then you've mm. even got, you know, things like investing in motor vehicles and other transport equipment is massive. So they're building these roads and then they want to invest in the vehicles to transport things across these roads. And then you've got smaller things, you know, um, textiles, clothing and leather and whatever. But then following right, like lower down, you've got mining, quarrying and petroleum because mining and quarrying and petroleum actually all kicked off in the, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s in Africa. So there aren't as many brand new projects out there. It's just Mm. expanding existing ones. But really interesting to see that it's the services, the infrastructure to move things around and construct things. Not an expert, but yeah, that's really interesting to see those stats. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the one that really stood out to me was the difference in in over one year in electricity, gas, and water, where it more than doubled in millions of dollars invested. Wow! In the space of a year, so there's obviously some very, very big electricity, gas, and water projects going on in Africa that's taking on outside investment. Wow! Um, and they're they're building things up from the ground up in there. So, yeah, really, really interesting. As well as that, it's exciting to see the countries that are actually investing in Africa by the number of projects they're investing in. The United Arab Emirates is actually leading the way. So the UAE, where Dubai and Abu Dhabi are, you know, they've got a huge amount of oil wealth, but they're trying to invest a lot of this because oil is going to dry up eventually. And the UAE lead with 306 projects that they've invested in in Africa. Yeah, and South Africa's uh, got about 100, Egypt got 84, and uh, Morocco is up there with 72. So there's a number of those more wealthier African nations that are that are really investing around their region, which is mm. really cool. Mm. And even Nigeria, yeah, like yeah, Nigeria and Kenya are also, and even the Ivory Coast. That's crazy. Mm. And then you've got Oman and Saudi Arabia as well. Saudi Arabia is a big investor. But yeah, crazy number of projects and. They all want to see things happen in Africa. Yes, there, there's um, there are some regions that are markedly uh, seeing increased investment, increased uh, foreign investment. Uh, particularly, uh, Nigeria is one of them. So they're in 2017 as opposed to 2016, they were up 49 percent in foreign direct investment. And uh, how do you say that, Joe? Is that Cote Cote d'Ivoire? It's actually Cote d'Ivoire. It means there the Ivory. Are. It's the Ivory Coast. Okay. Um, but it's the, it's the French way of saying it. Cote d'Ivoire. You know, that's a very go. fancy. A resident <laughs> French expert. Oh, uh, but they're up 68% uh, over wow. a year. So, um, mm. and uh, Kenya was another one up 14% too, and, and Egypt 22%. So, some, uh, some very big jumps there in foreign investment year over year. Interest, I found it interesting that Oman is actually have invested, like, in Increase their investments by 40% compared to 2017. Mm. Oman, right next to Yemen, right next to the United Arab Emirates, and right next to Saudi Arabia, and to Oman, who have a lot of sea access. These ports in Africa, you know, mean a lot of business for Oman. Mm. So it really kind of cool little connection there because we haven't really heard a lot about Oman. There's, it's a very controlled political system there. Uh, yeah. It used to be owned by the British, lots of wars. I say owned by the British. It used to be colonized by the British and, yeah, but there's a huge amount of investment in their ports and stuff like that. So cool to see where uh, they're you know, making a big investment as well. Mm. Yeah, and it seems to be a trend across the board um, that uh, that 
at least last year in 2018, the uh, number of projects being developed in Africa and where, the, where there's foreign direct investment going in are increasing. So there was a 12% increase year on year last year. The ap- actual investment had actually lowered last year, but the number of projects was increasing. Uh. Yeah, there's uh, like Nigeria is one that we've already highlighted, but, um, but that increased by 49%. So they're seeing some incredible activity. Kenya and Ethiopia are seeing very big amounts of activity as well. So yeah. So some more stats around where the money's actually going and who's getting it. And uh, like you were talking about there before, Joe, Oman is topping the list in capital investment for the Africa Middle East region uh, with $19.5 billion flowing in in 2018. Crazy. Saudi Arabia follow with $15.3 billion. Yeah, The UAE is next, 12.7, and Egypt with 11.4. And then we get into some of the more, I guess you'd say, traditional African nations. Yeah, you've got Algeria, Nigeria, Ethiopia. Um, then you've got Israel following, interestingly enough, um, mm. with $6.4 billion invested, then Zimbabwe and South Africa underneath that, and then other countries make up a, a decent percentage as well. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of money f- flowing into Oman. And uh, China-based Citic Group, which is a financial firm with global reach, actually plans to establish a new $6 billion phosphate production facility in Tabessa, Algeria, which is part of a 49-51% joint venture with a local company, called Sonatrack, and the plan is actually scheduled to go online in 2022 and will create 3,000 jobs. And that's really part of a, a larger trend that we're seeing in some of this data as well of China investing in a lot of money in some of these smaller African nations. Mm. So there are a few key trends to take away that happened in 2018. So coal, oil, and natural gas maintained the top spot for capital investment in 2018 with $134.6 billion of foreign investment recorded. Yeah, and foreign direct investment in real estate increased to 1,146 projects, which was a massive rise. Um, And that's actually... Uh, in, due to the popularity of co-working locations within Africa. And that's that's one of these micro trends that, that people have picked up on is that co-working is becoming very, very popular in Africa because it, it represents a uh, effective way for people to get access to office space without paying the full amounts for some of these offices. Mm. And the top sectors by the number of projects invested in in 2018 were software and IT services, business services and real estate, with real estate replacing the third-ranked sector, which was financial services. And then software and IT services maintained their place as the top sector for project numbers with 2,360 projects in 2018. Yeah, so the top five sectors by the number of projects, real estate and financial services, were the only two to achieve growth recently. But um, communications has witnessed an 11% increase by the number of projects too. So there's, there's growth in some other areas. So the biggest decrease in project numbers um, came in healthcare, which dropped by 24%, business machines and equipment, 14% drop, medical devices, 12%, and plastics, which dropped by 12% as well. So hotels and tourism witnessed a significant increase and that was of 120% by the number of projects. And uh, they've risen from 234 projects in 2017 to 514 projects in 2018. And they also saw an increase of 187% in capital investment. So hotels and tourism is booming in Africa. Mm. So it's worth looking at overall which sectors are most invested in. And from top to bottom, it goes from coal, oil, and gas take the lead with the most investment by far, then real estate, uh, then renewable energy, which is crazy, at $82 billion in investment. Um, chemicals, metals, hotels, tourism, uh, automotives, communications, software, IT, semiconductors, and then other stuff after that. Yeah, I mean, the big surprise for me is seeing real estate that's so high up there, but I guess it makes sense. I mean, if people are betting on Africa being a long-term play for investment, it makes sense that that will mean there'll be significant capital flowing into the country, which means Mm. a uh, rising middle class, similar to what we've seen in China and India, which means that real estate, particularly well-positioned real estate, uh, should rise significantly in value as well. Wow. So it's actually, it's, a, it's such a good point. So looking at the, some of those those growing African countries, 
yeah, property in the in you know near the center of the cities, things like that. You know, McDonald's will end up buying up a bunch of places mm. in Angola and Kenya, and well, if they don't, they they almost certainly do already. But yeah. you know, I heard once upon a time that you know McDonald's is actually a real estate business, not a restaurant business, because yeah. it's about the locations. And when people look at investing in places, you know, when you're driving around Luanda or Angola, you know, in Angola. If you're driving around the prime places, then that prime real estate is actually going to be worth a lot more. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, I guess it's just what you've seen in other countries, even you know countries like Australia and Canada and places like that. You could probably look at their rise and the rise in real estate 20, 30, 40 years ago due to the, particularly here in Australia with the mining boom, you know, all the money that came in from the mining boom and you saw a lot of these mining towns the property values went through the roof, you know, and, and mm. if you looked at that modelling and then said, well, Africa may go through a similar thing, then you could start working out where would be a, a good place to invest your money for a similar kind of phenomena to do with mm. real estate. Mm. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy to see. There's so much potential for for the whole continent and we're definitely going to be following this. I'm a huge fan of Africa and investing in different places, uh, in different funds that are uh, weighted to Africa. And yeah, especially seeing, you know, when you're seeing like um, Kenya and um, Angola and other countries with such huge rates of growth, it just makes me want to just keep waiting until I can just get in as early as I can on a lot of these index funds that, mm. that follow these countries because – so much potential. Mm. Ethiopia, Nigeria, Ghana, so much potential for growth. Yeah. I mean, is, is there anywhere that you've been doing research in lately that really sticks out to you as a place that people should check out? <sighs> oh, no. To be honest, like I've been a huge fan of Angola because I actually met at university, I went to uh, went to university with a friend who um, who's very well connected in Angola, and they introduced me to a lot of the excitement that was going on there. And looking at the telecoms industry and looking at the way that things are going, I was so bullish on Angola. But it's very hard for me to like from Australia, just using my regular you know um, stockbroker. It's very hard for me to invest in these countries, but. I'll certainly like Ethiopia. I've got some family friends in there. Um, Angola, Nigeria. I'm already invested in Nigeria. There's and even places like Morocco, but Zimbabwe. There's so much potential because Zimbabwe is right next to Africa. So I'm keeping an eye on a, a few of the bigger countries in Africa because the, when they start growing, that's going to beat any other investment I have out of the water. The only problem is if we have a recession in Australia and the UK and the US, it will just mean that things there get cheaper for a few years. So I'm mm. going to wait until if there's a recession here, I'll prob that will probably be when I'm investing. So one other piece uh, in the African puzzle is the recent uh, African continental free trade area that was signed into existence on the 21st of March in 2018 by in Kigali. And 44 of the 55 African Union member countries signed this agreement. So it's a very, very significant agreement and uh, is another step towards Africa building itself as almost a supercontinent for trade. Yeah, and... Interestingly, Nigeria, which is Africa's most populous country, and South Africa didn't actually sign that free trade area agreement, mm. which is kind of strange. But, um, but yeah, if, the, if it's successfully ratified and implemented, it will be the biggest trade agreement since the formation of the World Trade Organization in 1995. So, yeah, they want to create a single market for goods, services and movement of people. Yeah, so the plan is to establish and negotiate a continental trade protocol in goods, which, although in its advanced stages, remains to be completed. And the objective is to cut 90% of tariffs from their current average of 6.1% to eventually zero, which would build essentially a, a large number of non-tariff barriers and really make it so that trade can flow freely between a number of these countries where trade was actually quite cumbersome for a lot of the time. So the good news is this is going to make goods and services between these countries cheaper. So, I mean, there's, there's fewer expenses on trading between these nations. And, yeah, the removing tariffs, 
sounds like a really good deal for a lot of them. So it, I just find it's really interesting that Nigeria is not involved. South mm. Africa, they're kind of almost too like so Western that it's yeah, it's almost a part in a way. But the fact that Nigeria aren't signing on is is a pretty pretty big sign on it. But fifty uh, forty four sorry nations signed the agreement. So what's that space? South Africa as a continent is really interesting. Um, I know you speak about it a lot, Joe. We'll we'll continue to follow it and track it in our in our wider um, geopolitical news articles. But we just wanted to hone in on it on this episode and give a, a brief overview of what's going on because it may become one of the most important yeah. geopolitical yeah. players in 10, 20 years as more and more money flows into the continent. Mm, mm, absolutely. Wherever you're joining us from, it's a pleasure having you here. Why not drop into our Telegram channel and say hello, fomo.show slash Telegram. So this week in our privacy and security segment, we wanted to cover a uh, tool called MagicPad. Yes, yeah, so MagicPad, which you can find at magicpad.io. It was made by an ex-IBM designer. He wanted to make encryption tool interfaces really easy to use. Now, he wrote a great piece. And this is actually how I came across it in a, because I follow design news because I love design and fonts and typography and all that stuff. But in this UX design piece, he actually wrote a post about designing encryption tools for novices because encryption is notoriously complicated. And the, tr the, the really hard thing as a designer is making a really complex interface really simple. The magic is in making something really easy to use. So what does this actually do? So what it does is it's um, magic pad is a graphical user interface for um, using PGP encryption, which is the probably the most popular encryption method. So essentially, when you create a PGP key, you create a public key and a private key. Now, your public key, you can give to anyone. So you, Matt, you can generate a public key and give it to me. And I can write a message, encrypt it with that public key, and only the person who has that public key can decrypt the information result, which is within that message. Mm. So it means that I, um, so once I've got your public PGP key, I can write a message to you and nobody else unless you're using a quantum computer or something crazy, can read that message. Right, and it's been quite notoriously hard to uh, to deal with these PGP keys and there's all sorts of code that goes on and I've, I've crossed... Cross paths with them a few times, it's a few times in my travels, and it's always made my eyes glaze over. But it seems like Huan Co, who's been developing this, is uh, is doing is trying to make it a bit more easier for everyone. Yeah. Have some graphical representations, which we can uh, actually get a bit more of an idea of what's what's going on behind the curtain. Yeah. So what 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 they did is they they really like this is this is actually a really interesting user experience project. Now for the designers out there, this is really interesting to look at. But they wanted to make a flow so that you had to create your because when you start, you need to create a key, a key pair, a private and public, a public and private key. Then you want to be able to write a message to somebody who has a key. And you have to be at, like, they've made the interface for this so simple that it's actually taking a lot of the difficulty out. However, they explain in this blog post that it's much more difficult than it seems because to make something really simple takes a huge amount of work. Yeah, but look, the user experience is great. Like, you literally click on this thing, you open it up, it has a number of things there to do with your key management straight away. You can then create a new public and private key very easily. And there's just little tabs up top to where you can read things about your message. You can write things. Uh, you can sign your message with your keys. And, uh, yeah, I, I, and there's a little guide there at the end too. So it's, for me, the user experience seems really clean. It seems really straightforward. And, um, look, if you're playing around with PGP key signing or anything to do with uh, public and private keys, or you want to just give it a go and understand a bit more about how the encryption works behind a lot of what we do, um, could really recommend MagicPad. Yeah. So um, you can use it offline, which is the key thing. So you don't need to necessarily be connected to the internet, which makes it more secure. So if I wanted to send Matt a really private message, I could do that via using MagicPad as my tool. 
And the what I found the most important thing was actually just reading the post and seeing how they designed it and tried to make the flow right. But yeah, if you want to get, you know, send your messages securely, check out Magic Pad. Really, really interesting. If someone might enjoy this, please feel free to share it with them. You can find us at FOMO.show. You can jump on our Telegram at FOMO.show slash Telegram. You can follow us on Twitter at the underscore FOMO underscore show. And on YouTube at FOMO.show slash YouTube. That's it for us here at the FOMO Show. Thank you so much for joining us. If you like our show, please do feel free to subscribe in your podcast app of choice or via our YouTube channel. I'm Matt. And I'm Joe. And as always, remember, no FOMO. No FOMO.